The age is coming to an end, my friend. Twilight is falling, but a little light still remains. Guys, minions, and welcome to Unmade Gaming. We are here from the episode of Atari Twilight, Twist of Fate. Uh, this is unofficially season 2.5, uh, waiting for that ramp up to season 3 coming soon. Uh, but if you like what we do here and you guys want to support the channel, the best way to do that is by clicking over on our Patreon link down below. Uh, you can get all kinds of behind-the-scenes exclusives, such as the after shows for all these shows. Um, and while you're down there, click on that Discord button, join the community, uh, be a part of the community, be a part of the conversation. And as always, in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, you will see the corruption bar. That bar serves two purposes. One is when that bar fills, Greg gets to the hell he wants these wonderful, unexpected players here. And two, every single dollar that goes into that goes back to this uh, community for all kinds of things, such as artwork, uh, replacing me for my job, um, replacing uh, all the other things that I do with robots, uh, you know, that kind of fun stuff. Uh, so without further ado, I turn things over to Greg to take us back to the 80s that never was. Thank you so much, buddy. I can't wait back. I uh, can't wait to get back here to uh, Tori Twilight Twist of Fate. But before we can go forward, we have to go back, find out who we will be playing, who our characters are, and what exactly class they are inside the Tales from the Loop system. So let's go to Chris. Chris, how are you, my friend? Who will you be playing? And uh, what a tool set or kit or class will you be playing? Uh, I'm Chris, aka Necro. I am playing Ricky Lewis, and his class is Hick. Fantastic. Now, what I'm going to do is cycle through everybody, and then in reverse order, I'm going to ask a question. So I don't you jump on somebody to give their specifics and a question at once. So we'll jump to Melissa. Melissa, who are you? Who will you be playing? And class kit or playbook? Uh, I'm Melissa, Melissa Meyer, uh, and I am playing Heather Jones, who is the group's weirdo. Fantastic. Let's hop on over to Mitchell. Same bevy of questions, my friend. I am playing uh, Jesse J.D. Davis. His type is bookworm, and I'm currently being choked out by Starscream, so it's going to be fun. Again, um, I, we discussed it last episode. There are sentences that are being created inside this game that I never thought I'd hear. And I found out that some of them are my favorite sentences ever. And uh, that is one of them. I'm currently being choked out by Starscream. That's like a t-shirt, a big long one, but it's still a t-shirt that I want. Uh, or just like, a, an, you know, me being choked out by whatever. Uh, let's jump over to G. G, same questions. Hi, I'm G, and today I'm playing Scarlet Blake, and she is the class athlete of the group. Fantastic. Now, everybody, I would like to ask this question, because as we have just heard, someone is being choked out by Starscream. However, this isn't the Starscream of the 80s comics or even the Michael Bay films. Um, this is a Starscream that looks human albeit a tall, uh, kind of sinisterly dressed human, but a human nonetheless. And the question would be, in the grand scheme of things, this doesn't have to be um, violence or anything, but how disobedient towards the edicts and rules of adults are each of your characters? Meaning, when faced with the absolute defiance of an adult that's in front of you, that is imposing their will upon you, what kind of background does each of these kids where do they come from? Are they immediately going to fall back onto, it's an adult? Or have they evolved and grown to the point where even adults can make mistakes? Let's start with G. Oh, shit. <laughs> this is a tough one. Um, well, Scarlet definitely knows that adults can make mistakes. Um, her coach being one of them or her potential coach being one of them. So, um, yeah, I think, I think she would 
might be hesitant at first, but it would depend on, it would really depend on the circumstances. I think that she would be a little bit more um, uh, rebellious against them if, if the situation called for it. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so if with that being the case, maybe we should, I'll refine the question for everybody else because you answered it better than I asked it. Um, on, a, on the grand spectrum of things, uh, when an adult says something, issues a rule, does something, is it on a scale of one to 10, something that your character immediately would just accept? Or have you grown to the point where you would question? You know, and if you put yourself in that number, more towards 10 is more acceptance, less more towards one is defiance. I'll come back to you for a number G as we go around because, you know, math is always fun to talk about at the very beginning of a narrative story. Um, let's jump down to Mitchell. What do you think, bud? I think uh, from a scale of one to 10, I, I think JD would probably be at like a seven where he, I think he has a pretty good respect um, for all adults and especially those in like an authority figure, like a teacher or coach um cop something of that nature uh but not when he's being picked up by one so i think it's fight or flight for him at this point but yeah i think typically se about seven okay great so you're more on the ben mckenzie scale of adults as yeah. more towards one is the more jerry baker gotcha right. uh let's go over to uh melissa melissa heather where does she fall in the spectrum of obedience um, in terms of obedience to the uh, human adults in her life, I think that she really doesn't have the courage to disobey. So I think she is going to lean in towards doing as she is told, even though uh, I don't think that in terms of human um, adults, she has necessarily been put into a place where uh, you know, her integrity had to be questioned. So she's never necessarily been asked by an adult to do something that is in opposition to her values, but I don't think that she considers the Starscream to be a human adult. Having experienced Pennywise and uh, also having experienced uh, Randall Flagg uh, and maybe even, uh, you know, a Skeletor-ish Chief Rugen, um, she considers this to be maybe an evil character and maybe not even a, not a human and um, not necessarily in the class of, of, of an adult. Gotcha, gotcha. Chris, where does Ricky fall? The good old country Ricky, boy. <laughs> Ricky's very high up on that scale. Um, it's anywhere between eight, nine or 10. Um, but the adults in his life, they have always been a good clean force. Um, he's never had to deal with anyone that's pushed him down darker paths. Um, it's always been a path to the light. So he trusts them. Fantastic. And back around the horn, gee, if Scarlet was on the spectrum as a number, where would it be? I feel like I'm going to have to like uh, retract what I said, because I, I agree that uh, Scarlet um, trusts her parents and and being on a sports team, you learn to trust your coaches, even if you don't agree with them. So she would probably be like eight, maybe. She might not like the decision, but obviously there's not much she can do if the coach won't put her on the, on the field, right? So she might not like it, but she's just going to have to suck it up. So yeah, probably definitely a seven or eight out of 10. Nice. Perfect. So we've learned a little bit about the characters as far as their relationships, or at least their expectations of adults, um, especially those that, uh, again, not somebody you have to agree with, as G said, but somebody that you, you have to place at least a little bit of trust into, as is the, I guess, the feeling of the age, perhaps. But with all of that being said, we have to go back to go forward. But this is episode five. And in episode fives, I only ever say this. This is Garrett, Maryland. This is the 80s that never was. Everything is the same as it was in the 80s that we experienced. The music, the movies, the pop culture. However, in our Garrett, Maryland, in this 80s, all of those elements are real. The movies, the toys, 
Even the music is alive. What do I mean? Optimus Prime drives the streets of Garrett, Maryland. Gremlins harry our heroes that's all you need to know for this current moment because this is episode five and episode five it's a border world between what we've learned where we've been the paths that we have walked and the course that we will chart into the future and so with episode five upon us any introduction I would give, any raven wings that would fly, any words or sage advice from Maggie, or even secrets that would be told. There's no room for that in an episode five. And so my friends, we turn our attention to a scene inside the Garrett Library where one very real element of pop culture, a, an evil creature made flesh, literally, Starscream, the evil Transformer, the Decepticon, standing at a hardy 6'5 in a black suit, black sunglasses. Menacing, just in appearance, but even more so when he has lifted one of the kids, JD, by the straps of his backpack slung over his shoulders, lifted him easily from the floor of the old library, hoisted him aloft and said, Casey Mitchell, human designation, Casey Mitchell, you are coming with me. We have one beat, my friends. This is the beating of a heart, the fluttering of a wing, the blink of an eye. I need an action from Scarlet, who is closest to JD, JD himself, and the beginnings of either an action or some other type of movement you would like to do from Heather and from Ricky. This is a moment, this is just a flash, just a taste of Garrett before I welcome you in. Well, in relief, you said, uh, Casey, or human designation, Casey Mitchell, you're coming with me. And Scarlett said, oh yeah? And she's gonna kick him in the shin. You are gonna... cocked and ready to fire a kick. Mm -hmm. everyone else I think JD is going to try and like wherever uh, Starscream's hands are on me I'm going to try and like uh, you know just get them to loosen their grip try and like grab a appendage or finger or whatnot to try and not be held up anymore okay uh, Heather Ricky's, and Ricky yeah. Ricky's going to run forward to grab JD's backpack and try and pull him away. Hey, you can't get there, but you're in the process of charging towards there, kind of cutting the distance between you and your friends. Finally, Heather. Heather has the same thing on her mind. She's going to uh, run forward behind uh, Ricky to pull JD down. Okay. So as this almost with the, uh, a bit of a, an exclamation from Scarlet, but silently Heather and Ricky and JD fall into either preparing to get him away from Starscream's grasp or actively trying to pull. With the action in place, roll me something Scarlet, as you go to kick this man. How about a force? Sounds good to me. Let him go, fart bag. One success. And she's going to okay. just wind up and right into right underneath his knee. With that success, as you connect with the shin of this man, the success keeps you from breaking your foot. As Ooh. it glances off the side and you're able to kind of redirect your force just when you realize this isn't moving at all. It's even though I doubt anyone here has had the unfortunate uh, circumstance of having kicked a cinder block, but um, this would be very much like it if you had never done something like that. He pays you no mind. Oh. <laughs> and instead, as you're struggling to pull his hands away, 
he actually helps you, JD, and removes one of his hands, keeping you aloft with just one outstretched right. And as he looks at you here, and I believe we ended last session as I take a, a brief pause. We said it was 4.15, but we'd actually spent a half hour doing some work. So it's 4.45 p.m. on Saturday, December 3rd, 1988. A tree lighting ceremony needs to be attended yeah, 7.30. And with that, this man pulls you close to the point where he is almost, you're not within reach of your own hands, JD, but he gets you close enough to almost like he's inspecting you. Um, I don't know if you all were able to sneak in to see the movie Predator, but in that movie, the Predator examines skulls in much the same way that Starscream is examining you. And he says, strange that you would choose a form even tinier than the rest of these meat sacks, Wheeljack. <laughs> You look more like a bumblebee. Heather, JD, Ricky, take five. Bumblebee, bumblebee, bee, bee. Scarlet, the echoes escort you to the past, back to last summer, to the day you learned you were to make the Edgar Allan Poe middle school football team, the only girl in the state to make it to this level, but you haven't learned this yet. This is information that will come within the hour. You are still obviously anxiously on pins and needles, but as the brain often does, the smaller events of a momentous day are often lost to the more emotional memories generated. This is one of those forgotten moments. Everybody, please go to your Spotify playlist, which is a way that we kind of bridge the gap between here and there, between us and the 80s, and bring forth the music of the age to listen to and provide soundtrack to the stories that we tell. And with that, I'd like you to go down to the bottom. And uh, Joe has a song called You're the Best. You've probably heard it if you've ever heard the watch the original Karate Kid. Cue that bad boy up. Friday, August 5th, 1988, Edgar Allan Poe Middle School, precisely the track around the football field. In less than an hour, your brother will tell you, you made the team, but for now, for now you are on pins and needles. Kids are everywhere. Groups are practicing soccer. The cheerleaders are working on a pyramid. Damn, watch your nieces and you bony bitch, Peggy Swanson shrieks. Language ladies, shouts Margot Swanson, her mom, and the head cheer mom. Beside her, Mayor Bartlett talks with Mr. Derry, the science teacher. They smile a bit at the colorful language, but Mayor Bartlett claps for his granddaughter, Jill, near the top of the pyramid. The mayor has no idea that this is his last day on earth. The football team is in the middle of two a days, organized team drills every morning and cardio in the afternoon. For cardio, you are required to check in with the assistant coach in the stands, run two miles around the track, and then run burners either on the field or on the track. Once you are finished, you check back in with each coach and clock out. Stopwatches are provided for players that want to time themselves. If you record a personal best, you tell the coach in the stands, and he'll mark it down in the log. On this particular day, Scarlett has checked out a stopwatch which is currently dangling from a lanyard around her neck. As you are sitting there preparing to finish up your workout, you've been there nearly an hour, a boy, almost bald from extreme crew cut and further augmented by the whitewashing of sun-bleached hair, is soaked with sweat. He walks over towards you, a shy smile on his face. From the looks of it, he has been working out in the heat of the day for at least the hour that you've been here. He is small, young, maybe sixth or seventh grade. You think you remember him from school. He's wearing short shorts and a Karate Kid t-shirt. The shirt and shorts look too small for him, making him look even skinnier. Um, excuse me, is there uh, any way you could 
uh, time me. My, my watch is hard to read. I'm trying to trying to get in shape. I, I figure speed is, is my best bet, but uh, my buddy, he's really strong. And I'm, so I figure I can help out the most if I, I'm quick. Uh, yeah, uh, sure. And she dabs her forehead with like a, with her towel and stuff like that and tosses it to her bag. Uh, I, I can use mine if you want. Oh, oh, that'd be great. And he kind of reaches back and grabs his ankle and stretches out his quad. Um, again, you're not sure what muscle he's stretching here as there really doesn't appear to be any. Um, and once he's kind of done, he, he shakes and rolls his neck. Um, and he uh, sticks his hand out. M my friends call me B. B Seville. Hey B, nice to meet you. I'm Scarlet. I, have, I, said, I know. My last well, name uh, is yeah. Blake, so kind of a B. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um. Okay, so um, I'm gonna just do like a regular um, uh, forty yards, and you realize that sure. he probably just read this like 40 yards or like the, like a 40 yard dash is yeah. what you're supposed to do. I'm going to run 40 yards. Um, I counted it out. Um, I, I got 40 yards. Okay. And um, I'm going to run it. Okay. Uh, do you want me to start here and run 40 or go 40 and run back to you? Run back to run back to me. That's how they do it. The timers are typically at the end. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you want me to yell out when I start? Like, do you, are you going to yell go or I'll put my, I'll put my hand up. And then when I drop my hand, you go. Okay. All right. I can do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Does he actually go to 40 yards? Um, he starts to walk off and you hear, Hey dweebs, you want to make this interesting? Tom Hoffman, the starting quarterback oh. from the team and Brian Lars, middle linebacker and defensive captain, comes strutting up. What do you think? Brian, you want to see what these dweebs can do? How about uh, we make a, make a friendly bet? Screw off, butt munch. You know that while he would never admit it, uh, Tom is jealous of, as hell of Scarlet. He uh, hates that she's more athletic than he is. Uh, her command of the huddle, her knowledge of the game, he hates all of it. And ergo. And by willing feeling... to sit in the pocket, Tom. <laughs> he, Brian comes over and puts his hand on Tom's shoulder. Brian's a big kid. He's Jerry Baker sized. Um, but he seems like he probably attempts like 3,000 crunches a day. Uh, he's got that kind of V going on. Um, and you know that because he is wearing a half shirt um, with Braddock physical education written across it. Uh, he is hopeful one day, of course, to be playing at the high school level. He says to you specifically, Scarlett, not even looking down at B, loser leaves the track for good. You know that if this is something that is an actual bet, that means that whoever loses, if they were to honor it, they're not gonna be able to practice. They're not gonna be able to go for personal bests. They're not gonna be able to necessarily show off for the coaches, but they're not gonna be able to attend cardio, which means you're not gonna be able to sign in and sign out. This is a big bet. Does B react at all to them? Um, his eyes go from you to them, but he does not seem scared. Yeah, she she just smiles at him and gives him the thumbs up. It's like, come on. And she holds up her watch. You could do it. All right. All right. And Tom reaches back and stops Brian, who's getting ready to go down and race B. No. Let's do a relay race. Brian, then me. God. You or him than you. What do you think? If you need to prove something to yourself, Tom, come on. Yeah. And he dramatically takes off his aviator sunglasses and like flips them into the grass behind him. 
You can tell that they just arrived. They have not been running. They are fresh as daisies or whatever a piece of shit is when it's fresh. He thinks weirdly. Um, <laughs> so if so this he, is something that you would agree with, yeah, they're going to. B, are you okay with that? You want to do a little relay? He leans into you to the point where they, the other two probably can't hear. They're kind of laughing and getting ready in their own respects. And he looks right at you. You see that there is absolutely no fear in his eyes of these bigger boys. I, I don't mind at all. I've seen bigger. Yeah, they're they're not that scary. So she'll she'll put she uh, she'll put her hand out to shake B's hand. Like, okay, we're we'll do it. He he almost goes to shake your hand, and then he goes, "Um, have, have you ever seen Top Gun?" Yeah, my, it's one of my brother's favorite movies. Then he puts his hand up in a high five motion. He goes, I feel the need. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. And he goes, <laughs> and then he and, waits. And she's, and he's just like. The need for speed. And, need he, for speed. and he high yeah. fives you and then swings it down for a low five oh, yeah. from reverse. Fuck yeah. And um, the other two see this. And despite the delayed need for speed, it, it they caught just the end of like the clap and then the clap. And they're pissed that you guys seem to have some type of cool high five that yeah, she like have. Maverick and Ghost are going to kick your butts. Everybody can please go to your Spotify playlist and go down to the bottom. You'll see that there is one danger zone <laughs> by a Kenneth Loggins. Please put that on for me. B goes to the... You can see him counting off on the field beside him as he counts the five, the 10, and he gets, you know, 40 yards away. And um, Tom kind of moves in beside you. Relay rules. You got to get a high five. And then you and I run around into the curl, the field goal over there. Got it? Sure. That's all the rules though, right? Yeah, don't be an asshole, okay? He you're, turns back you're around. You're not going to warm up a little bit? You, that hamstring's looking a little... Mm. I'm always warm. He thinks he says <laughs> something cool. Um, and he turns okay. back around and lifts his hand up into the air. And Brian kind of lifts his up and gives a bit of a wave. And... Uh, B looks over at him, shakes his head, and he kind of gets down and puts his left hand over his left knee. Um, he looks more like an ice skater getting ready to speed skate than he does like a, a track and field uh, aficionado. Yeah. But he gets ready and he just locks eyes with you and nods his head slowly. And with the drop of Tom Hoffman's arm, they are off. My friend, I need you to roll me a move roll. This roll is done at a plus two dice because you have the support of B. Um, this will be the only roll that we make. Also, uh, Scarlet right now has a negative one because she has a, a condition exhaustion. From she does not have spot, a. So she, just want to make sure. Yeah, she yeah, is. She is you are now. without it. Yep. Move at plus two. You will have the ability to, yep. You have one the success. ability to push or, okay. So with one success, as the race begins, B is much faster than you would have given him credit for. You Thank see you. as his little legs begin to kind of move almost a, a step and a half for every step that Brian takes. And you can tell immediately that Brian realizes he's moving as fast as he can. And this little kid is keeping up with him. So Brian, being the friend of an asshole, making him a de facto one, goes to body check Ben as they start off about 10 to 15 yards into the race. But with your success, Ben gets redirected into the grass, does not slip and fall, and is able to make it back into the field and the track, moving stride for stride with Brian. As you, they get closer, Tom reaches out his hand, 
getting ready to feel the slap, the hand, you know, the high five that will give him the ability to go. You realize that they are in a dead heat. And when Brian's hand is still a good four feet away from Tom's, Tom starts running. You have not felt the smack yet from Ben, from B. What do you do? <laughs> you asshole. <laughs> she's going to chase after him. As soon as, he, as soon as he leaves, she's gone. And with that one just split moment, that beat, that flicker of an eyelid, the beating of a heart, B's hand claps your forearm in the appropriate tag as he stumbles and falls to the ground and slides a bit, the last of his strength expended in this rush. You may roll me another move roll, my friend. But because of oh. B's proximity, you still get his plus two. Move plus two. Let's freaking do this. Show this asshole. No. <laughs> You can push, push it. but push you, it. this will result in this moment of giving you a condition. So a condition will happen here. So I have to take it and then hit reroll or reroll. No, you can reroll and then you get it. Yeah. Okay. You still get the plus two from B. Can I use my pride? Is that a thing? <laughs> if you, yeah, I'll let you use it here, but you will not be able to use it later. Okay. Later. I won't, I will not use it then. Uh, all right. Reroll. Let's go. One success. <laughs> and I'm exhausted. As you run and then the, the track begins to curve as it kind of goes behind the, the field goal, um, you realize that very, the, the etiquette of the race completely out of it, Tom is now swerved into your lane. Um, he's trying to basically block you from being able to get any type of advantage, any type of uh, uh, position on him. And as you round the curve, he pops out towards the back and you are able to kind of jump over him and take his old position. When he turns to see where you're going, he gets tripped up over his own feet and you hear him go down like a ton of bricks. <laughs> and feel and hear the hiss of flesh on track concrete, track asphalt, that wonderful like maroon purple stuff that, uh, uh, replaces blood for just a moment until blood replaces blood. You run past the situation and the only person to have noticed this race or to be happy about its outcome is B who from his position still lying face down on the track punches a fist up into the air. Yes! 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 And he just looks around, hoping that, you know, like he hears a crowd going off somewhere. He hears the audience of some great concert cheering for an encore. Um, and he just points to you from the ground and pushes himself up and begins to come over. Tom so and I, Brian. I, I, make it, I make it to the, the finish line, I take it? Oh, yeah. You easily cruise past it. There is no competition as Tom has uh, taken a header. Tom hops up dusts himself off, realizes that several of the pieces of gravel are now kind of semi-permanent fixtures in his knees. He slowly brushes those, realizes he shouldn't do that in front of people because he's grimacing, and turns back to Brian without saying another word. B runs up. <laughs> oh, you see that? You were so cool. That was so awesome. I, you were awesome. I saw oh, everything. you were awesome. And she's going to offer the high five again. Uh-huh. And he lifts his hand up and he's just ah. drenched in sweat. And he, he kind of, you kind of guide his hand into yours as he high fives. And you see him stop. And he looks over towards the cheerleaders. And you see that the happiness from his face has faded. And he just like from his knees, he's just looking over in that direction and he slowly stands up and he's just staring over there. She's, she looks where he's looking. Are you okay? Do you need to sit yeah. down? Do you have water? Yeah, no, no, uh -uh. And when he looks over, you see that he is staring at, for some reason, he's staring at the mayor and Mr. Derry 
and there is a group of parents near to them and all the parents are wearing sunglasses. And you notice just, you're not sure why, but they seem to be paying more attention to the mayor and Mr. Derry than they are the kids on the field. From out coming from underneath the bleachers, you hear, Scar, Scar! And Kyle, your brother, is running towards you. Hey. He's just charging. He's like, yeah, he has a hand punched up in the air. B says, they look like us, but they aren't. Wheeljack told me they don't like water. If, if you see the eyes, remember that they, they really don't like water. Thanks for the race. What? what? Yeah, no problem. We and wanna... you feel arms wrap around you in an oh. almost semi-tackle as Kyle gets to you and lifts you up off the ground and kind of does a, a baby from Dirty Dancing as he lifts you up and he's just kind of screaming in your face. And he says, you did it, Scar, you did it. You made the team. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> she's, she's laughing and she kind of forgets that weird moment with B for a moment. And she's laughing and she like hugs him back. And as you hug him and you turn and look around, he's swinging you around so you get a full view, a full 360 view of the track and field here at Edgar Allan Poe Middle. The young boy is gone. For your flashback, my friend, you are awarded three successes of Ravens and Bumblebees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everybody go to your Spotify playlist as we return to the present, and please cue up Robert Tepper's No Easy Way Out. Strange that you would choose a form even tinier than the rest of these meat sacks, Wheeljack. You look more like a, a bumblebee. My friends, you are facing extended trouble. I need a plan from you all. The plan consists of the following. Each of you may roll once, for whatever skill you can convince me is applicable to the situation. Luck can be used. Pride can be used. I will let you know this. Luck will replenish upon each of our sessions. Pride, I will let you know when it replenishes. It is a, an extinguishable, extinguishable commodity from this episode five forward. Flashback successes can be used, but once gone, they are gone. Starscream is a threat level 14. Here is a warning. Starscream is a powerful foe that is not the only encounter you will potentially face in Garrett on this day. If we get a Michigan, mm. I can guarantee you he will not be the only deadly encounter you face on this day. Seven successes equals a partial success. Less than seven represents a shared failure. Failed roles will result in conditions for all. My friends, when faced with your first boss level, creature and enemy, what do the keystones do? Shit. <laughs> so he doesn't react when I kick him, eh? And the it only hurts thing, like hell. <laughs> the only reaction that he gives you is none. He pulls JD closer and issues that mm -hmm. statement of seeming to be more like a bumblebee than a wheel jack. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm gonna be like, what are you talking about? And then I'm, yeah, just let me go. And I'm gonna try and just drive a knee into the abdomen. Be thinking about this you don't have to tell me right now mitchell but is it something that um for them and by the way for this i'm bacon we're going to bacon for right now because i've got a mitchell and all kinds of things sure, sure, right sure, sure, sure. yeah that's fine that's fine um so with that bacon uh i need you to say if you would rather redirect jd's forces into a force role mm -hmm. or a charm role like are you trying to get him to react to your words what are you saying what are you talking about or no i think the, it's more of like a physical force. attack yeah the physical attack okay. it's more the the dialogue is just more for um, like probably what he would say. Gotcha. Yeah. So prepare your force roll, but do not roll it yet. We will okay. all roll together once we have decided. Next. 
Mm. Yeah, she's like hopping around like, ow, that's not right. The hell, holy crap. And uh, she's gonna look around and her dad is a firefighter. And um, so fire safety has always been uh, t- at the top of the lesson plan, essentially. Um, is there a fire extinguisher close by? Roll me uh, two, roll me a D6 twice. With a success, you see one. Two D6. Six and a one. <laughs> it just so happens that at this corner of the library, right in front of the research rooms, right between the Sherwood Forest and the Wizard of Oz, there rests and two code, great big old tank red uh, liquid fire extinguisher. Sweet. And she's like, JD, hold on. And she's going to run and she's going to grab the fire extinguisher. And um, yeah, her move is going to be to shoot him with it. And I, you don't even have to roll to know how to use a fire extinguisher because nope. of your, your, back, your established background. <laughs> the daughter of the chief of the fire department <laughs> should probably know how to use one of these. You would think that that would be a kind of shared knowledge. Everybody else. Uh, Greg, you said um, to give you a role that would be most applicable, uh, but our characters are already in mid-action. Is that correct? So does it need to be in alignment with that mid-action or what, what are your thoughts here? You're muted. Oops, I am. I just wanted to uh, see what you all I wanted to do in that, that one brief moment. You can change your course of action. You're not committed to that. So if there's something else you would rather like pull back and do, say how any other action you're you're not limited by what you did in the beat before uh, the kick and everything. Uh, in that case, as Heather's running forward uh, as she was doing, and then she observes what's happening before she gets there, she sees the uh, kick fail to to make purchase. She hears uh, star screams, commentary. She uh, sees um, you know the the response to JD. Um, she is going to skid to a halt and then uh, do what she does. And she's going to investigate the situation, take a look around and assess it to see uh, what, what, what elements are there to work with. Absolutely. Okay, so get me an awareness role ready here. And uh, finally- We'll investigate work for you. Uh, yeah, and when I ask a question or I ask you to make a role of a skill that doesn't exist, mm-hmm. you know, you guys know to go with the one that seems the most applicable. <laughs> so, Ricky, what have you got, my friend? Um, I, I, as much as I'd love to use Tinker because he's a robot, um, I can't think of a good way to use that. Um, I think Ricky's going to carry on his existing course of action uh, and try and rip JD free from uh, Star Screen. Okay, so. Your force role is to remove JD from the clutches of this creature. JD's force role is to get himself away from the clutches of this creature. And Scarlet's move is to grab the fire extinguisher and present its contents to Starscream. Um, fantastic. Yeah. Like her, her intention is to um, like dis- um, uh, like not, I guess, distract him or like, uh, you know, and so he... To, for the intention that he's going to drop JD. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so there's a, there's a combined sort of uh, uh, amalgamated plan that's, you know, unspoken plan between you all. Um, and I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but we got a, we got a Michigan that came in? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Oh, lovely. So um, with, let's see, your awareness role, your investigate role came in, but it, you didn't have any successes, correct? Okay. Um, I will say that you can push it. You will be given a condition if you do so. Um, you may use your pride for a success. You may use luck to re-roll. I think I'll go with luck to re-roll. Sure, or you can do none. I mean, it's, it's certainly not something that I'm gonna force you to do. Oh. Wasn't meant to be. You 
turn and look. And this is some place that as we established last time, Heather knows the library enough to know the sections, to know, you know, where's a quiet nook to read, someplace really where you're not going to run into too much foot traffic. That's the type of places that Heather is, is very aware of here in the library. And the library is huge. It is big. It's got eight, 10 foot stacks, it's two levels. The second level has wrought iron railing around it. It's a very large, very opulent kind of library for a, an age gone by. And as you look around for something, something to be able to use, something to kind of help with the environment, the situation to, 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 to aid your friends in their desperate time. Um, unfortunately, you don't see any of that. What you do see are two sets of eyes looking from the darkness in the back. These are eyes that are very familiar to Ricky. And these are eyes that you would have remembered from the Lewis farm. They're not attached to bodies at this point for you can't see that deep in the shadows for the shadows are growing here and the library is getting darker. My friends, Force, Force and Scarlet, what are you gonna roll for? Um, for sh shooting, uh, the I have no idea. Um, I would take a move. It's a dexterity type of thing. I would take a force. If it's something you want to do, you can convince me of something else. If you want to give it a shot, like a tinker or a. Mm, yeah, not a tinker. <laughs> if you're giving me a choice, I'm not going to choose. Tinker. I am. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you whatever's best, uh, um, whatever your skill set. If you want to look down, find your best skill and say, hey, can I convince you of this skill? Give me your pitch. I'm I really fair I, and impartial, Gina. I really want to do lead. I don't know how, like, she's just going to pull it off the wall. Sure. And she's just going to be going to like, stop, drop and roll, butt sandwich. And she's just going to. I, I will absolutely go with a lead. If that's what you want, if you want to roll the lead. And then what we'll do is we'll say any success that you have from this lead role can either be added to the group total, or you can use one of them to get you that pool of dice. Every die that you would kind of gift to me, I would give you two dice to add to the pool for you to kind of give out as a leader for this episode okay uh no bonuses lead let's go one success and now ricky jd give me those force rolls as i tell you all after your rolls tell me what's happened here in the library You are currently standing at three successes. And in this amber moment of the initial confrontation with Starscream, I will ask you this. You have three successes. You need more if you are to best Starscream. I will for the, I, I, I'm, I'm in a giving mood, especially since I received my Michigan. So I will tell you this, if you would like to buy yourself a success, you may do so using the following currency. Of course, you have your three successes each for your flashback episodes, but again, once gone, they are gone. You have your prides. You can use your pride. Again, I will let you know when those recharge now. You each have one as of this moment. Also, if you would like to give me a condition, I'll give you a success. What a deal. So, my friends, this amber moment is everybody acts. Is there any type of additional successes you'd like to add to this exchange? I'll drop a, from my three, I'll, I'll give two. So I'll have one left, if possible. A for mighty the, like, gift. Like so that puts us at five. Heather, yeah. Heather will uh, take a condition and give you a free, one of the free successes. And what is the condition? I'll allow you to, to, to pick your own condition. Hmm. Exhausted, frightened. Um, I mean, scared is very appropriate for Heather. So we will take that. And this is a kind of a combination of a lot of things, Melissa. You know, uh, as you've uh, RP, RP'd beautifully um, last episode, uh, uh, Heather's current state is... Um, I mean, she's been under an incredible amount of stress and pressure. And uh, for you, the manifestation of that in this moment and with the crush of everything before 
is just terror. Anybody else? Frank, can I re-roll with luck? You sure can. Now, I'll, I'll let you do this too. If you re-roll, take out the one die that you have as a success already and put it aside. So if you were rolling with four dice, roll with three. If you're rolling with five, roll with four. Um, any additional successes we will add. You will not lose the one success that you've had. I think it does that when you click re-roll, does it not? In roll 20? I, 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 if it does, uh, that shows you how little Greg knows about the system uh, as it goes technically. So yes, if it does, then right. just we'll edit that out in post. Yeah. <laughs> this isn't live. It's okay. There we go. Oh! Three oh! in total. Holy smokes. Okay. So yeah, that was a, a, an appropriate gamble and use of luck. So my friends, we are currently sitting at six, seven, eight, I believe eight, nine, because we had, had the initial three. No, we're at, we're at eight. The initial three, we had the gift of two that came in from bacon. We had the gift of one. Uh, so that takes us to six and then two additional successes from Ricky takes us to eight. Uh, Greg, I gave you one condition and one free success. So that would get be two for me. So that's up to nine then. Fantastic, everybody. If I up it up to 10, can we like do a fate thing and like take them out? Uh, <laughs> we get any kind of more bonus over him if we up the ante? I tell you what, yes. But the only currency I will accept, no, you know what? You haven't used any yet. So you, you can add as much as you'd like. I, I'm yeah, not I, ha I haven't had a chance to go yet. So, yep, yep. Uh, yeah, she, I, I'll, I'll give, cause she kicked. You didn't, you said I, she's not going to break her foot, but can she be, have an injured foot? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's interesting. Yeah, I will give you a condition. I'll allow you to RP that too, because technically when you're hurt, much like a, when Rob had his finger broken with Pennywise, technically it's not like he can't use it anymore because that would kind of limit his character going forward. Uh, but since you are giving yourself an injured foot, which is your means of mobility, um, if you want to RP that at any point, feel free to. Mechanically, it'll always be in place as a condition until it's cleared. But yeah. uh, so you have that. Um, or one and a half Michigans. Oh, I love that. I do so, so love that. Um, all right. So as this all happens, I can actually turn off. I, I never do this. I'm going to turn off the music for a second. So with this crush and with this just absolute outpouring of everything that you have, every Heather, how does your fear or how does your, how does this help the group? Um, is it a cry? Is it a, a word of warning and distraction? Is it something that in this moment, your gift that you've given them of those successes, how narratively does that play out? Like you can do anything. You, you could have Heather do something that's force related. You've gifted successes for this to happen. So I don't care what skill it comes from. Um, how does this work? And then everybody else, we're going to mesh in what you've originally said here as the sequence of events plays out, but Heather's going to kick us off as whatever Heather does is going to kind of start the sequence up. Um, Greg, the challenge that we have right now, is it both the gremlin in the dark and Starscream in front of us, or are we overcoming Starscream right now with the next challenge being the gremlin? The threat level that I've given you is for the library in its entirety. Mm. Now, again, the gremlins are technically a Michigan, so the threat level of Starscream remains the same, but I'm tying them together, if that makes sense. Uh, I think uh, what Heather's going to do in this moment is uh, first she'll say something, guys, guys, it's the creatures from the farm, and then she'll scream for help as she's pulling out her itty bitty book light to shine into the shadows. Uh, which would be plus two, because it is Absolutely. my iconic item. Right, and I love that. So um, I tell you what, since it's plus two dice, roll me two d6 if you would. And if one of those is a success, I'll allow you to bring roll back one of the su successes you put in there since you're actually using your, and there we go. You can choose whether or not you want to roll back your success that you gave or your condition. I, I haven't rolled yet. 
Um, oh, really? No. Oh, that's uh, JD. What? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I was, I saw everything kind of flutter on my roll 20 and I thought, oh my goodness, there we go. How do you, I'm sorry. How do you do slash R? Is that right? Slash roll. Or you can use the little thing on the side, yeah. Oh, okay. Wait, wait, no, two no. failures, yeah. right? Yeah, three and a three, yeah. So everything's still in play, but the itty bitty book light does come out. Uh, your iconic item that blazes into the dark. And here is how that all plays out. And everyone, I think we do actually need some music right here. So uh, go ahead and... Um, Let's do a little Bruce Hornsby, even though it doesn't seem like it works here. It will in a moment. As you extend almost in slow motion, the itty bitty book, book light and that, as we've narratively uh, kind of established, that bright lighthouse beam goes out into the darkness. Two of those creatures, those gremlin langoliers are illuminated. They feel the light and their eyes narrow as they squeal in pain. They move with unearthly strength and crash into the nearby bookcase in the little kind of cavern that they are in. And as they rock back and forth, they do so with so much force that the one that is on their right, the one that is directly behind Starscream, begins to tilt in his direction. The book's starting to, as a whole rack begins to move down. With the simultaneous crunch of a knee into the abdomen, doing more to act as a, a simple tool, a lever to kind of, for JD to push himself away from this grasp, the uh, straps on the bookcase snap as the threads around the tops tear free and the plastic hooks pop as you fall back with your backpack, but the straps are still in um, Starscream's hands. You didn't provide all of the force to move yourself away though, JD, as you feel Ricky, his arms wrapped around backpack and you as he pushes back to rip you further away from him. And as that image clears, and he's still standing there holding just two now vacant backpack straps. He is met with the picture of Scarlet holding a hose of a fire extinguisher directly at him as he gets a front row view to its eruption as it splashes all over his face, blasting his sunglasses off. And as the now very evident red eyes turn and look towards you, he screams out, pathetic falls, as it rips across his face. He backs up just in time to be clipped by the bookcase, and he spins off to his right. The glasses that were haphazard now go flying off into the library proper. You are all free for a moment, and as you kind of pull free, you're in a crescent moon around him. As the bookcase smashes to the ground, at the tip of the crescent is Scarlet, then on the sides, JD, Ricky, and at the other end, closest to the door would be Heather. For a moment, you are all on one side of Starscream. What would you like to do? I have more, but I'd like to know what you like to do in this moment. Hmm, I think it's time to get up and uh, run. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think I'll uh, JD will uh, grab Ricky because I think we probably fell somewhere near each other and just try and like help him up and be like, we got to go and start taking off. And I'm going to pick up my bag since I no longer has straps. I'm going to try and run and hold it. Right. You have the strap at the top. You're kind of carrying yeah. a briefcase style. Exactly. As, you're, yep. as you all turn to run, Starscream immediately writes his large six foot five frame as he kind of pulls himself back up to his height. You know, um, the, the fall of the bookcase doesn't seem to have hurt him as much as it redirected him. It just kind of made him stumble. It got him off of his game a bit of capturing you all. And as you all turn to run, you feel, yes, Scarlett. I, I, I feel like um, that's where her injury is going to come from as she's turning to run she's going to slip on the water and she's okay. going to, she's going to twist her ankle. So that's where that injury is going to come from. 
All right. And as you do so, you kind of twist your ankle. And um, I will say this, this is not something you have to do, but JD would be close enough to you that you could kind of grab hold of him if you want to kind of like hop along with him to kind of uh, keep your movement or you can go to ground. It's totally up to you. This is something that would put Scarlet I, prone or? Well, cause she's still holding the fire extinguisher. So I don't really think she can, uh, she can grab her JD. So I think she'll like, she'll, she's going to trip and she's going to go down on one knee and she's going to be like, ah, like she's going to like just cry out with like the shock of like the, the rolling of the ankle. Right. And it gives that, that very kind of subdued pop that pop that, you know, just you, you feel that internal, it's like a, a knuckle on a finger, but deep. Mm-hmm. And it's that, that, that awful pop and that immediate feeling of immobility in the, in the ankle where it just starts to immediately swell, immediately hurt. Um, you feel that kind of ache pulse up your calf into your thigh. Um, as the rest of you turn to run, Scarlet going down before any of you can react, Heather, you're closest. And as you kind of turn to like usher everybody through and um, in your kind of state of mind that you're in, that, that, that terror, you turn around and you see, and this is what seven successes by you, buys you, Hannah Casper, the librarian at the front of the library. Um, she is holding a Cal Ripken signed bat from the sports memorabilia section. She is pointing it at the man in the suit. And she says, you leave these kids alone. Though no one in this room would know, but Hannah Casper was the daughter and the granddaughter of a father and grandfather that desperately wanted a child that played baseball. So with the grace of someone that has taken thousands of practiced and coached swings, Hannah draws the bat up to the ready. You let these kids go. Or I swear to God, the devil himself will weep when he sees what I've done with you. And she pulls the bat back above her shoulder. My friends, this is an environmental advantage. It's been given to you in the form of an NPC. This is Hannah Casper. She is going to buy you time to leave. But I'm not telling you what to do. I think Scarlett's going to stand up and like carefully stand up, turn around, and she's gonna ugh, totally overhand this fire. How big is the extinguisher? Is it one of those really huge ones? Yeah, this or is, is like, more of a- like the old school, like scuba tank sized ones, you know, okay. like, like the, the big tanks, like you have to go <laughs> take it to one of like the uh, the air compression, sta- compression stations to get like refilled and stuff. Uh, yeah, so she ain't, she ain't spiraling it this <laughs> Uh, so you're definitely close enough to like you know shot put yeah she's of. yeah she's just head over her head and she's just gonna throw it at star scream and then she's gonna turn and run as best she can you can do so um uh, you roll me a force just to see as you're turning to go uh this will be taken into consideration for a, a kind of a cumulative type of thing um the rest of you hannah as if you're Heather is the, as we said, the point of the, what'd you get? I didn't see it. One success. No, sorry. Okay. Zero, 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 zero. Okay. Um, it, it hits him. You hit him, but it kind of bounced. You hear that goom, goom, goom. It hits to the ground and he's almost kind of like dusting himself off. He has that foam and powder and liquid and shit all over him. Um, it'd be comical if it weren't comical. Um, Heather, you are at the edge right beside where Hannah has run up. Um, she almost like a, a mother for a child in the passenger seat. She's given you like the mom, a seatbelt as she's put it, puts it around her, uh, your arm, trying to get you all behind her as she's standing there and then regrips the bat chokes up a little bit. What do the rest um, of you do? Heather, um, uh, is definitely in a fight, uh, flight or freeze mode. Um, but she believes in um, heroes, and she believes in what is right. She believes in you know the stories that are that are there, and um, she knows that uh, Miss Miss Casper uh, w- is likely to die if they leave uh, her here to face Starscream. Um, and so she's she's not a fighter, um, but she's going to stop once again 
and evaluate the situation to see if she can see any um, any other creative solution. So uh, can I run or uh, roll another investigate and see if we can make that work? You certainly can. Absolutely. Oh. One success. Um, I tell you what, I will give you information about your environment or I will give you information about Starscream. This is what does Heather want? What do you think, guys? Environment or Starscream? Hmm. I, I would. <laughs> I'm voting environment personally. I would assume Heather would be more interested in the environment. Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, Greg, oh, go ahead, Jason. Uh, I was going to say, uh, I will not vote then. I have, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have been outnumbered. He was going the other way. Or, yeah. Yeah. or unless if, you, if you're if you evaluating Starscream, you can tell Hannah where to hit. That's the option. That doesn't help you at all. I'm sorry. Let's go. Let's go with environment. Okay. Um, again, this is a moment in the books that you read as a reader with uh, clenched chest and bated breath as your heroes are in a struggle for survival, except now you are between the sentences. You walk among the words. And as you are there and you look around and you see what's going on, you realize that the only case that fell, Clipping Starscream, was the case on his side. There's another case almost ready to drop and he doesn't see it. And it is poised at almost a 45 degree angle right above his head. He actually steps back into it to try to avoid that puddle of chemical suppressant that's on the ground as he dusts himself off and again, lifts himself to his full height, his eyes red. The other environmental thing that you notice is Hannah Casper doesn't seem to be taken aback by his red eyes. Um, how, uh, how precarious is this bookshelf? Is it just like one of those things that just needs a tiny, tiny nudge or is it a, it needs a, a nudge nudge? Right, this is like a cartoon where the car goes over the cliff and it's going like this mm -hmm. and you know, the All roadrunner right. comes over everyone just touches it and it flies off. Heather has her itty bitty book light in her hand and she checks it at the bookcase. You're, you're sacrificing your iconic item? Maybe she can pick it up later. Sure, yeah, absolutely. In fact, I will tell you this, just because it's close enough, um, uh, you could use the iconic item if you'd like and you can retrieve it. You know, if it's just, just something that you have that you throw. And so you throw it, it's weighted enough where it hits and begins to, again, your role for determining this was already the success. As you hit it, it begins to move. Ricky, JD, Heather's already taken, or uh, uh, Scarlett's already taken her, her kind of shot put. Each of you have an action as well as Hannah is trying to kind of mom arm you behind her. I got to have an idea. How about instead of your book light, how about you throw that phone book? Because you want someone's you, back. It's in the backpack already. Yeah, or or is it? I don't know if we were returning no, it to you, Hannah's uh, desk or not. So we may, it may have been in our arms. Oh yeah, guys, I mean, if I was holding the book, the the phone book, that would definitely be a preferable to my. That's a two handed throw, though, you know. Yeah, <laughs> but it's it should be enough. It should be enough to move the bookcase. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you might have to absolutely a circle a little bit. Um, yeah, just so narratively, we we established something too. Is you all copied down the names of the the. The mm -hmm. names, addresses, and telephone numbers, with the exception of George Butts, uh, that you were looking for. You didn't just take it. You didn't take the whole book with you. The book you did take with you without checking out was the Morse code book. Uh, yeah. You stuck that in your backpack along with uh, uh, when Bacon sheets of Boy Scout papers. <laughs> when Bacon yeah. was in <laughs> incapable of leaving <laughs> the dots and dashes on the ground, I was like, I take them all, and then uh, uh, scoop them up. Yeah, so that's what you have. So yeah, absolutely, we can retcon that where it's the phone book, which is awesome as Heather kind of grabs it like somebody that'd be like throwing a pizza box or something, you know, and uh, twists it and it flies through the air. Ricky, uh, JD, anything you guys want to do? 
No, nah, I think JD's running. <laughs> so Scarlet was when we all started moving and Hannah appeared. Scarlet was on the far side of the bookcase or uh, of Star Scream and the bookcases to everyone else, and she stumbled part of the way, um, twisting her ankle. I feel like Ricky would turn um, to run back and grab her and just try and help her and bring her through, rather than leaving her on the wrong side of Hannah to. Uh, to start star screen, just try and pull her through. Okay, so I'll ask this question, and this is obviously something that can be vetoed by G as Scarlet's uh, uh, player. But how does Ricky help? Does Ricky do like the arm over the shoulder, you know, help you off the field, or does he go full on like platoon where he goes down into a fireman's carry and kind of gets her over his shoulders or pick her up like going over a threshold? Um, within player you know agency and all that good stuff but uh what's the attempt and what's the outcome let me ask that ricky's attempt is to basically get his arm around her and just help her along it's not a fireman carry her out okay yeah and uh, i think that would she and she would she would go with him and then but as soon as she starts running that's when she realizes that she's not that she is actually hurt she hurt her ankle pretty bad and she's like ah and she's like limping like pretty bad yeah and then so ricky you would feel that too you would feel that there's an awful lot of weight coming from scarlet as she's leaning heavily on you because um to, to maintain that type of speed there is a moment where you're her leg you know so all of her weights on you as you kind of move and usher out of or towards the exit of garrett uh the garrett library so with all of that happening i will say that with ricky coming back Scarlet doesn't have to roll to get clipped by the bookcase that is falling. So Ricky, you're able just at the last second as the bookcase kind of comes down, it would definitely have hit Starscream first and it does so. And you see him reduced to his knees as both of the joints just buckle. <laughs> and his arms immediately come up to kind of Samson and hold this bookcase in place as it has driven him into the hardwood. And Hannah keeps the bat ready as she looks at everyone. And my friends, I would like you each to roll for me a force. These are forces not for Scarlett or JD or Ricky or Heather. These are forces that you are going to give to Hannah. Oh no. As she, as Starscream drops down, holding up this, his head is outside of the bookcase as the rest of his body is underneath it. You see Hannah, as taught by her father and grandfather, point to an unknown place over the shoulder of Starscream. She cocks the bat as she calls her shot, and she steps in to swing. Everyone roll me a force. I'm going to roll and give her one of my ravens and bumblebees. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm going okay. to give her one of my um, once a queen of Narnia, always a queen of Narnias. Nice. Greg, I'd like to use my last luck on that roll. You may absolutely do so. Nice. One you success. said, Greg, you said luck resets at the end of each episode, or when does it reset? Luck will reset at the end of each of our sessions. So you will always have luck when we start a new session. Pride, however, is now a semi-expendable commodity. Okay, I'll use um, one of my lucks to, to try and help her out here. I would yeah, also so, like to use some of my luck. Yeah, you have, you have to try, man. If we don't, just, who knows what happens to Hannah? <laughs> so I got three with my bumblebees and uh, ravens bonus. Okay. Add them all up for me, uh, friends, because I know that you added some things in there, but just from the rolls alone, I see one, two, three, four. I think it's six because we have a Narnia and we have Bumblebee, one of the Bumblebee ones. So that's six total. Six total. As Hannah steps forward calling her shot, she Starscream's head comes out as he looks. His red eyes are now expanded to the point where it's not just the pupils that are red. It's the entirety of the orb are glowing red. And with 
a like an ab, absolute malevolence this this hatred fueled by this kind of led fired you're reminded of the blue inside the window of optimus but this is 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 much it's more this is more sinister it's the same type of glow but it's red it's it seems hate filled even with just being light and you see her step forward as she cocks back and with a perfect swing she simultaneously swings and says the following that's not casey mitchell you idiot crack and as she cracks you see star scream the head goes underneath the bookcase. His feet spin out like the Wicked Witch of the West. The case comes all the way down on top of him. The books that were inside cover his form. And you see two size 14 dress shoes sticking out from underneath. And they are twitching oddly, kind of almost like a broken metronome as they go back and forth. And as that clears, you see semi-familiar lion in the mural behind doesn't react but you think there would have been a nod of approval if it could hannah turns the broken bat in her hand it now just says ripkin along the side and she turns around and looks and she goes go go oh can you be okay she nods her head yes Guys, come on. We got to go. We got to go. Let's go. Okay. She's going to She's gonna try and grab Heather and pull her if she's not coming. Uh, Heather's going to pull away a little bit and then run and give um, um, uh, Hannah Casper a hug. And she says, come with us. Come with us. And she, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. But you go. They don't know who you are. And she's moving with you. She's leaving the scene. She's not like lording over this, this fallen form, but she's backing up with the broken bat. Now it looks almost like a, you know, like a shard of something, like something better equipped to take out a vampire than a transformer. We'll put a pin in that. And as she backs up in a way, she does two things as she gets to the circular desk out front. She has three things. She grabs her purse. She goes to the bulletin board and grabs all the wanted or the missing posters off of the board, including the two of Rob and George. And she takes the crystal that's hanging in the window and shoves it in her pocket. She's the last one out of the library, but my friends, you have saved the life of Hannah Casper as you burst into the beginnings of a snowfall here at five o'clock PM, December 3rd, 1988. You are back out in Garrett. Did you get your Xerox? Yes, she stopped it. That's the fourth thing she did. She got her Xerox because she is a goddamn professional and she got the Xerox. <laughs> Thank you for those. We need to make sure we get them. In fact, that's what she was coming back to give you uh, when she stopped and grabbed the bat and went to work. So uh, yes, you all have that now. You're rocking and rolling with everything you had because of the expenditures of your successes and your roles. You have escaped the Garrett Library, my friends. You are still, of course, in the wonderful, now starting to snow in a snowy snow globe town of Garrett. But my friends, your day is not over yet, at least not until 7.30, which is two and a half hours away. What do you do? Or better yet, since you have this moment, Hannah is watching as you guys at least get to your bikes and kind of get away from the scene. Um, and you see her moving towards her Volkswagen bug. Um, you assume it's hers, either that or she's stealing a car. Uh, she gets into it and you see her going one way, but not until you guys have gotten almost out of eyesight. Before we separate, uh, Heather's going to yell out to her, stay in the light. She just holds up the broken bat as if that's an answer enough. Uh, the 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 twenty thin tent twenty two year old that is Hannah Casper face claim Joan Cusack uh, is shaking like a leaf. Um, it's just the and it's but it's not from fear. You don't think it's like the after effects of adrenaline. Like if you've ever seen a major league baseball player crack a grand slam and then hit home plate and they're just jazzed up from what's just happened. This is a grand slam. Uh, I feel good. Yeah. 
Probably start pedaling towards the attic. Hmm? Or where He's, do you guys want to go? Unless we're, we're trying to go to the yeah. mall. But He's we're like... able to ride. That is so I feel like we would have gotten on our bikes and headed in a random direction until we started talking, maybe. And yeah, because we're like, we're in, we're, in, we're in flight mode right now. Yeah. So we're just like, get the hell out of here. Right. But then as soon as we start uh, calming down from that, Heather would be like, which way's the mall? We need to talk to Van Halen more than ever. What was that? Oh my God, and she and she's pedaling, but she could tell like she's like she's she's wincing a little bit. She's trying to hide it a little bit, so that uh, she's not going as fast as she usually is. His eyes, his eyes were red, and he talked funny. At Why least did he didn't grab JD you. was Casey Mitchell, the missing kid. I don't know. I don't know. But I don't know. And then he mentioned Bumblebee and Wheeljack. I've never even talked to Casey. Why would he think I was him? I don't know. What's Bumblebee and Wheeljack? Uh, th those are just two other Transformers. The Bumblebee. Autobots. They're, those ones are good guys. Oh. Like Optimus. Yeah. We'll have to, maybe we can ask him when he's better. Yeah. Maybe they're in town too then. Yeah, maybe. I suppose. I mean, we can use all the help we can get. Yeah. Where, but, where are we going to find but, more Transformers though? I don't think we can worry about f finding them. I think we know Van Halen's at the mall, or we we suspect that, right? That's where help's going to yeah. be. We should go there. Yeah, who's always helped us, help us. and then, she's the one who's helped us, and then, you know she helped us with Pennywise, and maybe she can help us with these guys too. Yeah, yeah. I think she can. She's our best hope until Optimus is powered up. I guess. Mm -hmm. I guess. I don't remember She's what she stop. did for us, for, for Pennywise. Because she was she sleeping was, the whole time. She gave us advice, I think. I don't remember. Definitely all, gave us we guidance. All, we she all gave, kissed gave, her. She gave us, <laughs> she gave us guidance. Say. <laughs> she gave us guidance both times, right? So, like we rescued her the first yeah. time and then. And I don't remember what what the guidance was that she offered us, but hmm. well, it, we were given a mess. We received a message that kind of are pointing us in that direction. Yeah, I think we should. I think find her. yeah, I think the the mall is the best choice. Let's we we got to turn here, otherwise we're we're gonna go all the way around, and she's gonna turn. Go towards the mall. Yeah. Yeah, you're able to redirect. And uh, from your approach from the library, no matter which direction you went into, you'd still be kind of heading from the north to get to the mall. Um, you do see the still kind of shell of the burned out house that is Sarge's, um, or was Sarge's. Um, and as you kind of curl up and pedal a little bit slower, as you get to what is essentially like a kind of a, a capped hill, a plateau that has the Maplehurst Mall sitting on top of it, um, you see that the place is completely packed. There are cars in every space. Um, you know, uh, Veronica Kirkshaw's uh, uh, Volkswagen used to be parked among all of these, but every spot is filled. This is the beginning, the, the, the really kind of the height of the holiday season. And uh, with the tree lighting festival going on, there is an abundance of shoppers who are taking this moment to kill a couple birds with one stone and getting a lot of their goods. But you riding bikes, you're able to negotiate it carefully, but you get to the bike racks outside of the movie theater. And uh, you know, that is the closest entrance into the mall. And um, my friends, you are at the, the temple of retail worship here in Garrett, Maryland. 
and you are the only ones to ever go into this mall beyond the movie theater. Are you ready? Before we head yeah. in, what co what color was the uh, Hannah's bug? Out of curiosity, it was like a tan. Um, again, it, 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 I'm super duper old, so there is a it, it's like a tan that's sort of yellowy. Um, so, you know, it's not a mustard or anything, by God, but it's a tan that's sort of yellowy. So, like that's a Sienna, a, you know. Sure, <laughs> <laughs> but more German. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, All right, friends. What would you like to do? Park our bikes. All righty, my friends. You are able to park Head your in. bikes, get them ready. And as you go into the mall, uh, again, uh, G, I will leave this, completely up, leave this completely up to you. But um, your ankle is well enough to walk on. Uh, mm -hmm. we, you, narratively, you can have it come into play anytime you want. I'm never going to say, hey, your movement speed's reduced or anything like that. This is your story. You chose to have that as your, so you play it whenever you would like. You know, um, With that, as you walk into the Maplehurst Mall, you are greeted with the following. It is packed with holiday shoppers, retail establishments selling everything. Music, toys, clothing, disc jockey and Camelot music provide the tunes. Uh, KB Toys and their rows of Transformers and Cabbage Patch Kids. Chess King with the fashion of the day. Gee, these are just four stores out of nearly 50. And much like the Times Square of New York or uh, many of the crosswalks of Boston and Chicago, there, it's nearly shoulder to shoulder in here as people are carrying bags and groups of people are, are kind of congregating and talking and, oh, you know, someone back from college or back from the service or here for the holidays as people are talking, shopping, moving through this artery of commerce. Um, and uh, kind of above this din, this, this kind of uh, high mid-level just talking and everything you can hear christmas music that's being piped through the public address system um but as you listen all of you hear the almost like the volume of the holiday music goes down and no one else save you all notice another song takes its place everybody if you could go to your spotify playlist please i would like you to play the very first song on our playlist love walks in by Van Halen. Um, you walk through, and much like a, a an X, there are two large kind of crosses. Each branch coming from the hub of the Maplehurst Mall is just filled with all of these aforementioned 50 shops, but in the middle, it's called Center Court. And you all would know that in Center Court, uh, there is a large kind of, uh, it's almost carved like a tree, but it is a four-faced clock. And people are able to go there, you know, meet when they're shopping, check the time, do all of those things. Um, and during this time of year in particular, Santa Claus erects his toy shop just below the clock and asks the younger residents of Garrett two very important questions. Have you been good? And what do you want for Christmas? Now, at that particular area, Santa's helpers man cameras, assist with long lines of children and hand out candy canes. Each helper is dressed in the green of toy shop elves, complete with bells and upcurled boots. As you reach center court through the throng of people, and just as it's like a, two large families kind of pass and open up the area, you see center court. And the clock is still there. It is still center of center court, but it's no longer just a clock. Instead, it is a great golden tree with four clock faces set kind of haphazardly into the different sides of the trunk. Beneath the great tree, the great tree that none but the young seem to notice, Santa's toy shop is in full swing and a very familiar elf seems to be handing out candy canes. A sugar stick for you and one for you. As you approach, Van Halen rushes toward you 
and wraps her arms around all four, four of you. You got my message. Looking directly at Ricky, she says, you stayed ready. We did. Van Halen is among you. What do you do? I think Scarlet like leans into the hug a little bit more uh, at this point. She like will put her arm around her and like put her head down, like on her shoulder. Uh, Heather is shaking and she's holding her light. She's been like looking in every shadow as they've been walking through the mall. And when she gets the hug, it's like a big massive relief. She leans in and she starts to sob. What are you? Um, what are you doing here, though? Why, why aren't you at your tree? Why are you here? She takes a moment to kind of squeeze Scarlet and definitely takes a moment to like, you know, it, she doesn't release the hug from Scarlet and Heather as they kind of fall into her. And Ricky and JD, you'd see her face, which is always has a smile on it, which always seems so alive. It drops a bit. Um, and she really kind of with very strong arms, uh, not enough to hurt, but enough to, to really warrant the idea, the very symbol of an embrace kind of pulls the two of them in. And Ricky and JD, you'd see her face do that fall and she would look at you, JD, and she'd say, I'm working. I got a job because I moved it here and they just said, hey, would you like to be an elf? And I said, I could try, I've seen plenty. Uh, okay. Why, you, why couldn't you just tell us, though? I didn't want anybody else to hear. Okay. We, were, we looked for you. We went, we went back to your tree, and we couldn't find you. They found my tree, where I had it. Who's Who? there? Where is it now? Like, is it the, safe? like the red-eyed guy? Mm, the walker. I don't know who he sent. The walker. That's, the Randall flag or is it Pennywise? Um, she turns around and uh, yells in this kind of almost like like pitch perfect sing song voice that Greg could never emulate. But she uh, yells back and she says, hopscotch, I'm taking my break. And this like 40 year old guy with a graying beard who is also in the green outfit looks and he goes, okay as hopscotch gives her her break um when um when heather um when she said is it randall or pennywise um i would i think jd would go f to like grab her hand and like hold it tight if she'd let me yeah uh, heather does and then squeezes back and, and holds tight Sweet. Um, Van Halen sees you do this and she looks and she says, great idea. And uh, Ricky, she kind of reaches down and grabs your hand and like lifts it up and looks at it and then looks at you and looks at your other hand and looks at Scarlet. We should stay together. She'll hold her hand together. <laughs> And he takes her hand. And then Van Halen looks at Scarlet and looks at her other hand and looks at JD and Heather. Heather reaches out and grabs Scarlet's hand. Together, Still guys. Together. Yeah, stick together. I think JD just smiles. And so with Van Halen leading the way, you all begin to move deeper into the mall or you're at the deepest point. So now you're kind of moving away from the center court as you head towards the edges again, but this is a different direction than you, you arrived in one of the a different prongs that kind of goes off of center court. Um, and uh, like a Piper Pied, she moves you all through Maplehurst Mall until you see the blocky letters of Camelot music. And you see that this place is packed 
with shoppers, people coming out with the, the yellow bags that are long filled with cassettes and things of that nature. Um, she leads Ricky in as part of the Keystone train. And uh, you see, she raises her free hand and waves uh, the bell on her hat jingling um, as she says, hi, Brad. And Brad Miller, he was behind the cash wrap of Camelot music. Uh, his power mullet is touching his back between his polo clad shoulder blades. Uh, he waves and smiles and he says, hey, Vanessa. And she says, my room open. And he says, you know it. And she goes, thank you very much, Brad Miller Band. And she heads back to the back, kind of weaving expertly like the head of a snake through the sea of humanity. At They're least a little before. slower because uh, Heather, uh, Scarlet's limping. I don't know. And she doesn't pull on it. It's not like something where she's kind of tugging Ricky, who in turn tugs Scarlet. Um, she realizes that there is a, uh, the gate's a little bit slower. And without being told to, she kind of powers down a bit. Um, she tends to be very fast when she moves, but you can see that she's making an effort to, to slow down. Um, she takes you into the back, normally reserved for a place where there would be restrooms or, or you know, employee only areas. Um, but when she goes to the back through the stacks of cassettes, uh, you see a neon sign that's illuminated and written kind of in handwritten letters. And it says listening rooms. And Van Halen moves to the one in the rear of the small hallway. And on the door of listening room number two, there's a poster depicting David Lee Roth and Edward Van Halen um, that captures the two showmen in mid-performance. Uh, your Van Halen steps up to the door, kisses both showmen on their heads, and opens the door and allows you to walk into listening room number two of Camelot Music. Inside, it is dark, except for twirling globed lights of green and red. There are also pinpoints of blue light that seem to be emanating from some type of screen or some type of uh, like pinhole device that is just casting these rays and they move in tune with the music, at least as soon as it starts. She moves over and she turns and that kind of nebula, those points of blue light with the splash of green and red, um, she looks back at your group you know, Ricky, then Scarlett, then Heather, then JD. And she says, have a seat. And there are four chairs in listening room number two. She goes over and touches play on an embedded cassette player in the wall. And everybody go to your Spotify playlist and please turn on Journey, Only the Young, which is track 12. She turns on the music, and as soon as the music hits, the globe lights stop for a second, and then in perfect time with the music, begin to swirl, one following the percussion and bass, one kind of rising and falling with the lyrics, and the pinpoint lights kind of capture all of you in this kind of stellar embrace as the, the lights just work with the music, creating a sensorial experience. And among those lights, taking particular attention to Heather and to Scarlett, um, Van Halen kind of kneels down in front of the two of you. Is everyone okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Just a little tired. Had a busy day. And she kind of just like shifts in her seat a little bit. She was a very bad man. Yeah, he's been. A he might be following us. He or attacked those things. He attacked JD at the library. Yeah, we were able me, to get away. Held me up by my backpack. Called me um. Casey Mitchell. Mitch. I guess I don't know. I've never met him. I know he. We went to school together, and he's a freshman, I think. But you don't look anything missing. like Mitch. I know it was weird. Um, yeah, and and then he said something r really weird. He 
he said he said he wasn't he wasn't wheeljack but he looked mm. more like bumblebee yeah, like small. and those are transformers right she smiles but she kind of puts her hand on heather's knee and turns to jd are you okay when he picked you up are you okay yeah i've just never i've never really been um this never happened to me before so uh, i'm okay though optimus prime he's in trouble too and what if the creatures go and get him before he wakes up she kind of nods but it's the nod that it's not a dismissive nod at in the least it's a nod of comfort like like she's taking it all in and she's kind of, you can see that while that kind alive face on Van Halen is there, there's more to it. Um, in fact, roll me and empathize, anybody. I'll take four rolls if you want. Well, might as well give four. No successes, <laughs> Scarlet. <laughs> Ooh, JD with the Clint, as always. <laughs> this game has loved my roles, which has been mm -hmm. nice. <laughs> it's always good when you find that system. Yeah. Okay, so for Heather and JD, you would be able to glean the following. Um, and uh, JD, I'm going to allow you to ask an additional question. You can ask me a question about Van Halen, but both of you glean this, that... Um, despite kind of acting, not aloof, but acting like she doesn't quite understand what's going on or the severity of the situation, that with those empath empathize roles, you realize she is very aware of the situation, of its dire nature. And she's, my second question would be, does she seem optimistic? she seems incredibly optimistic. Cool. And she's looking at the four of you, and I'm going to give you this because that was a great question. Um, she's looking at the four of you, and you realize that optimism stems from you. She feels that way because she's with you all. She looks over, but then she kind of takes in Scarlett and Heather and JD. And then she turns and looks at Ricky. You haven't said anything. Are you okay? Ricky's just quiet at the back, shaking his head. And as she says that, he snaps on and says, what do you mean? He looks at Scarlett. It's, it's been a busy day. I mean, he was shot at. We, we found a giant robot in my silo. Nearly got, JD nearly got killed. It's, it, and he just shakes his head. It's been more than a busy day. Like, I know. It's, it's crazy. I don't know what's going on. And she Heather shines her here. book light into the corner of the room. I thought you were going to say he shines it in her eyes. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> Not the itty bitty book light. <laughs> um, she doesn't take her eyes off of Ricky. But when the light kind of flashes in the corner, she says over her shoulder to Heather, they can't get in here. You know that for sure? Oh, yeah. Sweet. Well, they don't like Journey. Which, of course, makes them evil. Of course. Yeah. It's the only logical explanation. But what do you know about them, though? Like, they're a great band. No, and no, it's no, Steve no. Perry. Oh, what? <laughs> not, not sorry, not Journey. Um, about whatever's here, the that the guy who attacked us. And... What is that? And why? And why did he think JD was Mitch? I don't. I just don't get it. She still hasn't taken her eyes off of Ricky. It's not trying to make an awkward moment, though it may feel that way for Ricky. Um, but she moves over and stands 
beside your chair, Ricky, if you're seated. Um, and Ricky whether you, standing. okay, then where the, she would probably kind of like sit down on the arm of the chair that's closest to you, Ricky, and enough where she can have all of you kind of in her view. Um, she doesn't like take center stage or take the front, but the lights are still spinning as is the journey. And she said, you can, I have some things to tell you. I wish I could have told you before, but I didn't know where everyone had gone and I lost Veronica and I didn't want to put any of you in danger, but then I realized it was time. I, and she looks and says, I was, I was sent here to ready the field. We, we thought Garrett couldn't be reached until the, the veil drops, but we were wrong. We believe that, that none could make it here unless called. And, and then it required magic greater than any we have ever known to, to cross the veil. The veil is, it's what separates my world from your world, your world from all the worlds. It's not so much a veil as it is. And she looks at JD's backpack like that. Only inside is this place. And outside is everything else. Why does, does that make sense? Well, it, kind of but how how come other people like randall and pennywise and whatever that thing was at the library why can they get through this veil more than the good guys we don't know they have help i think it's that loop place okay where the do you know where casey is do you know where any of the people who are missing are or oh, where Rob, Rob is? Rob? Yeah, Rob? Or he's we need to Optimus, find Rob. Optimus wants us to find him. She nods. If we're, and she kind of reaches over for JD's backpack. Yeah, I'll, I'll help her. Do she it. takes the backpack and she says, if we're, and she unzips the top and kind of puts her hands inside and like pokes the fabric from the inside. If we're in here, Mitch and all the others, and she pulls her hand out and puts it around, they're out here somewhere. Somewhere. On purpose, did they get taken? It's more complicated than that. They have a purpose, like you all. And what's that? Well, we don't know how the how the others are getting here. The the walker has seemed to be a step ahead of us, but he doesn't know everything. Randall Flag? No. No. The he who walks among the rows, between the rows. He's he knows that Garrett's the Nexus. He knows that it's and he holds up the backpack again. This is the hub from which the other worlds revolve. We're center court, she says, trying to like complete a metaphor. Is that like why we, they're all coming here? Is that, a, that we had a purpose? Yeah, a great battle is coming between all that is good and the row walker. The walker has marshaled forces of his own, but they're selfish and maniacal. They can't work together. They don't want to share a throne. Flag, Archival, Megatron, the False. The Walker brought them all here, but he did so clumsily. Now they have gone rogue with their own pursuits of power. You must help me, my friends. You must fulfill your purpose. Wait, what do we do? What she stands. We do? She stands up as the lights dance off of her face. And as she smiles, you can see, especially JD, that optimism flood through her as she looks at each of you. 
She looks at Ricky, JD, Scarlet, Heather, but then comes back to rest on Ricky. You must help me, my friends. We're going to bring back the Autobots and we're gonna drop the veil. And that, my friends, is where we end this session of Twist of Fate. Shit. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Oh, wow, 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 wow. Wow. All right, my friends. Wow, uh, what a blast. I'm going to step on uh, Mike's toes until I call him in at the end and we'll go around and talk to everybody. Let's start with GG. How are you? Where can we find you? And uh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> my mind is, uh, Scarlet's mind's a little blown right now. Um, yeah. My name is G lightning and Boker on Twitch, lightning spaz on nine on Twitter. Uh, you can find me pretty much all things unmade gaming right now. Uh, modding during the week for void on Thursday and Unhallowed on Tuesday and next weekend, Patreon games. We have one shot next Saturday and we're moving the rise to next Saturday. So that's where you'll find me. Fantastic. Of course, the ever-present Discord. <laughs> As we drop down the Mitchell. Mitchell, my friend, how are you? Where can we find you? Uh, and uh, why is Journey a great band or why are you wrong? Uh, I, I don't know if I can say why they're great or why I'm wrong, but uh, they are just a great band. It's just the way that it goes. Um, I am Mitchell. Uh, go by As Told by Dice. We have uh, I have a, a Twitch channel called As Told by Dice. We are running uh, a, kind of a, a different version of Lost Mine of Phandalin called Lost Miss. And uh, I'll be taking over the DM seat here in like, I think in a couple of weeks, maybe at the beginning of January um, for an Icewind Dale set D&D game. So check me out there. But I'm always in Discord as well. Um, that's kind of where, where we do most of the magic for, for us anyway. So um, it's been a blast being able to do this. And now I'm, I thought, I thought we nailed it that Randall was he who walked between the rows. And now I'm I don't know. <laughs> it's all over the place, isn't it? But I guess we have com confirmation. They are not the same person. <sighs> well, Mike told us as such. <laughs> yeah. At, at least as much as Van Halen is uh, uh, convinced anyway. Yeah. Uh, thank you, buddy. Let's uh, jump over to Melissa. Melissa, my friend, how are you? Where can we find you? And uh, Van Halen, uh, David Lee Roth, Sammy Hagar. There's really no answer to this that's wrong, but go ahead. Um... Okay, uh, I did not listen to a lot of rock in the 80s, so I would say none of them, though I appreciate them all now. Is that fair? Sure, um, sure. <laughs> um, so let's see, who am I? I'm Melissa Meyer, my handle's Draft Deer. I, uh, but everybody calls me Melissa, don't try to pronounce that name. And I am nowhere, this is the only place I am, but I am a massive fan of everyone in this room and you guys can't see that Unmade Gaming, Mike is also in this room, but I am also a major fan of his and a major fan of a lot of the other people that are in chat right now. So you can just find me and everyone's fandoms uh, rooting them along. Fantastic, my friend. Fantastic. And G, I'm going to ask you a question when I come back around because I realized I didn't, but I'm going to start and go down to Chris. Chris, my friend, how are you? Uh, where can we find you? And um, I, I'm going to ask you the only character specific question because I think this demands Ricky's current state of mind. That last kind of, it has not been a typical day. <laughs> um seemed to sum up a different ricky than we I, I was like i need more time to explore this so i'm going to yeah. push it to the next episode so well, what's the state of mind of our country boy uh, ricky's ricky's very concerned um he's not doing particularly well with the fact that everyone sees this as smooth sailing um the way they, especially scarlet sitting down and going yep no we're all right things are great <laughs> <laughs> kind of threw him off and yep we'll uh we'll see where that rabbit hole leads um but i'm chris ak necro you can just about find me in the discord otherwise here um for twist of fate and the rise next weekend other than that nowhere else fantastic fantastic and um i will say this i i, I would go back up to g for this one last question did you actively decide to make it an ankle that was twisted for Scarlet? And if so, do hard boiled eggs fix it? 
no our world egg will not fix it um I, I was originally thinking like a, like a broken toe or something like that um but i wanted i wanted something that more can like hinder her movement a lot more so and personally i love it yeah I mean, so i'm like i'm like how is she <laughs> how is she going to uh uh, fight through this one right and we can talk about it more in the after show so <laughs> fantastic and as for me my name is greg grimjack 21502 uh you can find me in the discord i'm not on the social medias um if you uh would fancy to uh, look at me anymore who would want that but you can see me on fridays uh over on uh, academic foxholes channel for a little game called city of light and shadow um but uh season three coming soon to uh unmade gaming uh, and of course, the continuation of the Twist of Fate saga, which even though this is episode five, it's not over. We have uh, seasons come and seasons go. So we will see exactly what we have. But Mike, my friend. That's me. I'm here. I'm back. Thank you all so much for being here. This was an amazing episode. Um, Keystones, uh, you know, you, the fate of the world literally rests on your shoulder. The Autobots can't come back, so don't fuck this one up. Uh, that being said, we're out of here. We're going to do the after show, which you guys can get over on the Patreon uh, probably later today if I'm on my game, uh, which I sort of have been. Uh, so for mm -hmm. now, we will see you guys next time for more twist of fate and keep your eyes peeled on the horizon for the release date coming this week for atari twilight season three uh but that's it from us we'll see you guys next time for from all of us to you bye bye <laughs>